Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year, and welcome back to the Economic Development Webinar Series. Today we have a fascinating topic, and this is breaking records for the most popular webinar we've done in the last year. Today's topic, regulation and opportunity in the recreational cannabis industry, and I'm sure everyone is fascinated. Um, we'll be focusing on the industry, however, not product use, so get your pens and pencils out and get ready to learn. I'm uh, excited to be here today in the unceded territory of the like, Lekwungen speaking people, known as the Esquimalt and the Songhees First Nations. And I'm going to be joined today by Peter Goh from MNPLLP. And soon to be joining us will be uh, Terry Rosal and Josh Huska from the Liquor and Cannabis Licensing Branch in the Ministry of the Attorney General. Reminder that today's session is being recorded. Uh, the speaker slides and presentations will be shared in PDF format on our website, as well as a video of the presentation uh, will be going online. It takes us about a week to get those produced for you, and you can look under BC Ideas Exchange on gov.bc.ca slash economic development for the past webinars recordings, and you can see everything that we have done uh, going back several years. So uh, I'm going to let each of our speakers introduce themselves rather than uh, me provide their bios for them. Uh, first, we have Peter from MNPLLP talking about the recreational cannabis industry. Uh, take it away, Peter. Thanks, Susan. Good morning, everyone. Hope you can hear me all OK. Uh, beautiful, glorious, sunny day here in Vancouver. I'm uh, broadcasting from our office. I'm going to do a little bit of the corporate swag for everybody to know which firm I'm at. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, my name is Peter Go. I lead uh, our enterprise risk services practice uh, for the province of BC for MNP, LLP, and also our cannabis industry services team. Uh, I've been uh, doing this for about uh, 25 plus years uh, in professional services. Uh, lots of connectivity with uh, many of you out there in the in the audience. I know there are a lot of people that I recognize the names and certainly the organizations that you're with. And uh, certainly I think uh, with many of you, I've been in your local chambers of commerce or some of your local events uh, presenting on this topic and, and others as well. Um, Susan, I don't know if we're going to launch right in or we're going to do the intros for the rest of the folks. Uh, no, let's go right ahead and, and launch right in. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Hopefully, you can see my slides okay. Um, I'm going to go through oh. these fairly quickly. We can't, uh, these see, your, we can't see your slides yet. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. While, well, while you're doing that, I'm just... Ah, there How we go. I, now it's good? coming up. Okay, good. So that's what happened. You said launch right in. I didn't remember which mouse, to, mouse yeah. button to click. Yeah. I'm just going to remind that. people, as they have questions that come up during the webinar, um, feel free to ask your questions. And as Peter is sort of switching topics, I'll be following along and I'll ask your questions. Uh, so Peter will be talking for 25, 30 minutes. So by all means, ask questions and we'll put those in there with a little bit of time for questions at the end. And then uh, we'll switch over to Terry and Josh and they'll give their presentation. And again, ask questions when you have them. Thanks very much. Yeah, excellent, Susan. Yeah, and you know, I welcome a lot of questions. It makes the presentation a lot more lively. So let, let's dive right into it. I'm, I'm going to move through these slides fairly quickly. Uh, make sure I'm on the slides. There we go. Okay, so who's MNP? Uh, fifth largest uh, accounting professional services firm in Canada. We are uh, definitely made in Canada. We started in a little place called Brandon, Manitoba, which I can guarantee is a lot colder than it is now for uh, all of us here in BC. Uh, we are now the second largest firm in BC, uh, that located in 20 communities throughout. So we're in the Peace District, through the Okanagan, uh, across the Lower Mainland, Caribou, and up and down Vancouver Island. Um, what's our uh, sort of approach and sort of footprint in the cannabis industry? This next slide shows many of the clients that we work with. Uh, these are span sort of licensed producers. Um, some extraction companies, some retail companies, and some edibles companies. Uh, most of these are Canadian-based, but there are also some U.S.-based ones. Uh, Dixie, for example, which is just past the Aurora uh, logo. I think many of you know Aurora and Tilray being two very big licensed producers 
that are operating in our province. Dixie is a U.S.-based edibles manufacturer that has listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange and is looking to get into the Canadian marketplace as a result of the legalization or the upcoming legalization of edibles in October this year. But more on that uh, a little bit later. Some of the things that we do, we, we run the whole gamut of services to the cannabis industry and the public sector. Uh, we are currently doing an evaluation uh, assignment for the province of BC, but we've done lots of work way back into the MMAR, MMPR days. And again, I'll walk through the history of some of those acronyms. Um, you know, as accountants and professional advisors, we do like our TLAs, our three-letter acronyms, and I'll, I'll sort of break some of those down for you. Uh, but it goes through the full gamut of this. One of the things that um, we're very uh, proud of and certainly very relevant here in BC because of the strength and maturity of our Indigenous communities and Indigenous uh, business entities is we work uh, very closely with First Nations. In fact, right now we have four assignments on the go with Indigenous um, feasibility studies around building a cannabis business uh, in their communities on their land. So I'm happy to answer any questions around that because I know it's very relevant for all of us on this call. So uh, let's get into the Canadian cannabis landscape. A little bit of a snapshot. Is it legal? Yes, it is. Um, October 17th last year, um, I wasn't in town actually, I was in Europe, and my wife and I were sitting in a hotel room and we were watching the BBC and, uh, you know, there were two reporters, and I can't imitate the, the beautiful, posh British accent, but if you can imagine two reporters speaking to each other about, you know, how, the ha how happy the Canadians are today because of the legalization of cannabis. And once they got over some of the sort of the wit and the tongue-in-cheek comments, they really dove into the conversation. And what was really interesting was um, the acknowledged leadership that we have on the global community of the way we've undertaken legalization. Uh, we've gone through the, the medicinal regimes uh, all the way into the legal retail regime. And that was very, very positive. Um, a lot of the conversation circled around what will the rest of the world do? What's Europe gonna do? What's the UK going to do? And in essence, much of what's happening in terms of legalization or decriminalization seems to be following on the path that we have set and uh, a lot of people are asking us a lot of questions to try to implement it in their jurisdiction. So uh, very positive news. Uh, for those of you who don't know what's on the screen, on your left uh, is a excise tax sticker, that uh, sample of one of those that must be applied to cannabis packaging. And on your right is a basically a screw top. If you look at it, it looks like a prescription pill bottle. It, certainly pretty much it pretty much is and uh, gives you a sense of some of the labeling that goes and this is what you will find in legal retail outlets right now whether it's the government-owned store in Kamloops or in some of the legal private retailers that have started getting their approvals and started operating around our province so with that let's keep going a little bit of the history uh, I one of the things I don't like to do for my audiences is read slides to you. Uh, I think we're all literate and all adults here. So I'll leave that for you to peruse. And again, as Susan said, these slides will be available uh, in PDF format. And I'm also happy to answer any questions um, afterwards. But it gives you a bit of the timeline here and some of the sort of the governments and the parties that were in power when the legislation changed. What we have right now is we still have the ACMPR, so Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes Regulations. That, condition, that, that continues and that allows those who are registered for medicinal use to continue to buy directly from licensed producers. But what has happened uh, as we transitioned in uh, the, the Liberal government under uh, Justin Trudeau is that we started working on the adult use recreational rules and in essence the passing of Bill C-45 really drove the change of legalization into the recreational and consumer markets that we saw uh, culminate in legalization last year in October and has recently uh, resulted in December announcement of the regulations, proposed regulations 
for cannabis legalization of, uh, legalization of edibles uh, in the fall of this year. In fact, uh, Bill Blair reiterated that legalization of edibles will occur in October of this year, October 17th, a year after legalization of cannabis. And uh, But he did warn that it may take a while for the market and the provinces uh, to get sort of their ducks in the road to make sure that product is available for consumers. So that gives you a sense of the timeline. Where's the industry at? These numbers keep changing. We keep updating them. Um, it's a bit of a shifting landscape. In the top left, we have 146 licensed producers, so those who are licensed to cultivate under Health Canada. Uh, the number of ACMPR, so registered medical patients, numbers over 340,000. Um, the bottom numbers, the bottom row is very interesting. Um, there was an estimate in 2017 of 4.9 million. Uh, so about 15% uh, of our population uh, were uh, consumers of cannabis. The estimate back then was 5.7 billion. Uh, it has since gone up. The estimate of cannabis demand is 2019. Those are very difficult numbers to land on. But what's important is um, not only understanding that the size of the market is something that we are still trying to wrap our head around, but also the delta between what demand might be and what's available supply. So I'm going to click here. That is what was an inventory that we know of and that was reported to the Canadian government as of September of last year, so just before legalization. The numbers since have gone up, but if you look at the delta between demand of 926 tons, metric tons, and 102 tons of dried product and oil, you can see that we still have the ability to generate a, a very large um, additional capacity of 800 tons. 800 metric tons, just, you know, let's just put that in perspective. 800 tons uh, is 800,000 ki uh, kilograms is 800 million grams. If you multiply it by the price of cannabis, anywhere from $6 to $10, that'll give you a s sense of the retail inventory that's available. Some of that is retail, some of that is medicinal under ACMPR, and some of that also is for export purposes. So to say what is specifically earmarked for Canada, it is really hard to land on that number. The fact, though, is with a, eight, so a nine times increase available to meet demand, uh, you can understand why the activity still continues to be so frenetic in terms of cultivation and the ability to put product on the shelves for consumers. On the next slide, uh, I go through some recent Stats Canada on cannabis. Uh, we, we jokingly call it Stats Cannabis these days, but this is Health Canada data again. Um, again, it shows that the inventory levels are rising. What's really interesting is sort of uh, the sales component the finished inventory, so those are the bold lines in the unfinished inventory. Um, at 109,000 kilograms, or 109 tons, we have uh, dried and 26 tons of oil, or 26 liters, it's not exactly tons, um, the measurement's a little, the density's a little higher. Um, we're still a far cry from the 900 tons we saw in the other uh, slide. So estimates of demand and trying to figure out where the supply and demand curves will cross will continue to be a really interesting exercise. It's actually become a bit of a spectator sport for those, those of us in the industry. But, you know, suffice it to say that uh, supply is not sufficient at this time. So um, I'm going to jump to the regulatory regime. Uh, I'm looking over here. I don't see any questions yet, so I'm just going to keep plowing ahead. I want to make sure I have enough, uh, leave enough time for uh, my presenters that will follow. This slide, in a nutshell, um, really spells out the Canadian regulatory regime. The first three chevrons on your left, that is under federal regulation, so Bill C-45. So the supply, which includes seed stock, uh, the production, which is cultivation, and the processing or extraction 
Those are all under Health Canada regs. There are specific licenses that people have to apply for. Um, I want to make sure for all the economic development folks on this call that you don't think this is uh, something that we just download the form and fill it out. I mean, there's an element of that for sure. But right now, the cost of getting a production or cultivation license, just the consulting fees alone typically is about a quarter million dollars. That's on top of the need to build a facility. A modest facility is probably eight to 10 million. Uh, a larger facility, larger being 15 to 20,000 square feet, will push you into the 15 to 20 million stage. The massive facilities that Aurora, Canopy, Tilray, some of those, I mean, those are, you know, in tens, uh, you know, $50 million and up. Um, and so this is not for the faint of heart. For those 146 licensed producers I showed in two slides previously, um, it's about a 10 to 1 drop off of those who apply to those who actually make it. That ratio of conversion is getting better just because people are getting better at it, but it's still not something that you want to undertake lightly. Now, knowing BC, we're going to talk about microprocessing, and I'll get to that in a later slide, but um, you know, just as a rule of thumb there, a microprocessing license, again, the consulting fees, and, and MNP doesn't do the consulting. We can support entrepreneurs and the consultants by doing projections and feasibility studies, but the consulting fees to fill in and submit your Health Canada application uh, for microcultivation right now is about um, the big national consulting firms are charging about 85000 So 85000 I'll repeat that, as a fixed fee. And on top of that, you still have hard costs. You still have to hire people. Okay. Back to this slide. To the right, the two lighter green ones, distribution sales, that is all provincially regulated. We have some of our licensing folks that are going to come after me. But in essence, that's the LDB at the distribution point. Every licensed producer has to sell their product into the LDB. The LDB has been very transparent, very clear. They put a 15% wholesale markup on, and then it goes to the sales channels. The sales channels can be the uh, public store, which is in Kamloops, or it could go to private retailers, many of whom uh, have applied and some of them have sprung up. So I'm not going to steal my colleague's thunder, but that is the provincial regulatory regime, and that's how it's split up in almost all the provinces. I'll have a summary of the provinces in the next slide. Interesting enough, quintessentially Canadian, as I always say, uh, we agree on a lot of things, but we always do things a little bit differently province by province. So here in BC, wholesale is public through the LDV. Retail is hybrid, as we talked about. Online retail is public, again, through the LDV. Many of the provinces have a variation on that. What was really interesting was Ontario, when they first came out, so Ontario has probably the largest number of licensed producers. Actually, not probably, they do. Um, and they're going to allow the most uh, retail outlets. Uh, but when they first came out, all of that was going to be public. And then with the election of the Doug Ford government, they switched that around and decided to go private retail. And then since they've iterated on that, and they created a lottery scheme where only 25 people got a, a lot winning lottery ticket, which created unbelievable angst and concern and the, uh, the push to resell some of those. They can't resell it, but I've heard offers of up to $5 million from some of the licensed producers to get a toehold in some of the best locations in Ontario. So it's a crazy market. Um, you know, more to see as Ontario rolls out. Um, the one that stands out as being totally privatized is Saskatchewan. So, and uh, it's interesting, some of you may have noticed a CBC article about a young lady from Saskatchewan. She just graduated from business school. She wrote a business case and she actually got one of the private retail uh, licenses uh, to operate in Saskatchewan. So, lots of entrepreneurs, lots of activity, and again, lots of variation as well. Hey, Peter, we've got a, oh, hey Peter, we've got a question Go for you. Uh, question okay. is, any idea how many of the licensed producers to date are in the microprocessors category? Sorry, microproducers uh, category? 
There, there, I can answer that question, there are none. Because the microprocessing category just opened up for this year, so those applications are now starting to be submitted and working itself through the Health Canada licensing regime. Oh, okay, so there's no micro producers yet. Wow. Not licensed by Health Canada, yeah. Now, what's interesting is, again, you know, respecting that this is a BC conversation, is, come on, folks, there are lots of micro cultivators out there. We know that, right? And many of them are having to make some decisions. Do I stay basically in the, you know, gray, black, illicit market, or do I convert and move into the legal market. Those who are wanting to convert are going to go through the Health Canada licensing regime. Those who are not will continue to go the way they are going. The reality though with October 17th of 2018, with legalization of adult consumer cannabis, is that unfortunately their days are numbered. Now, some of them will still continue to operate quite well and still make money. But we're starting to see a move, even though it's early days, where retail, cultivation, soon to be edibles, all those things, if people want to do it right and at, a, at a, a large scale, they will move into the legit, legitimate market. So um, we're, we're starting to see this. The other thing we're going to see, and this question's really good, and, and I can build on this, is we're seeing the large licensed producers creating micro cultivation activities. And I'll get to that in a little bit, but that actually creates economic development opportunities throughout BC for the microprocessors or micro cultivators and um, the, the licensed producers either in a joint venture format or in other formats. Oh so are so the are the question. Are the big guys buying the little ones or, or investing in micro producers? The uh, short answer Susan is yes. No. Um, but the little ones that the big guys are buying tend to be other licensed producers of which which are not micro cultivators. Yeah. Oh, so okay. they're buying other licensed producers who already have their Health Canada license to grow or are on their way and therefore they're gobbling them up to, to get that capacity. Remember that 900 ton, uh, the 800 ton gap we talked about earlier? Many of them are, are still building into that capacity. Or so, buying into it. Okay, so then the, the small sort of mom and pop operation that's growing their own and wants to get in, they have a, a choice to either go through the Health Canada process or stay on the fringes, as it were. Yes, yes. And what I see, I think, you know, if I could put, you know, look into the crystal ball, right? And, Trust me, my crystal ball is not that good. But if I look into the crystal ball, I could see a movement eventually where the large licensed producers or those who have the Health Canada license uh, will work in a joint venture or a cooperative, collaborative format to help some of those others on the fringes who want to get in to get into the legal space. But, you know, until we get uh, the micro cultivation licenses well underway and being approved by Health Canada, the reality of that can't happen until that regime has, frankly, got its legs under it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, well, I've been uh, answering the question. That was a great question. Thank you for asking. I'm not sure who asked that question. Um, I wanted to put the um, BC public uh, sort of cannabis framework here up for everyone. Um, I think uh, enough media has covered all of these. Uh, I mean, you know, you still can't drive when you're impaired, and I think we all agree to that. 19 is the uh, minimum age for plants per household. You can see all these things, and you know what? This, this is unlikely to change. Okay? So let's keep moving. So what's happening? Um, there's some industry bottlenecks that are, are preventing the free flow of the entrepreneurial spirit to really uh, land. And, you know, we understand that. I think as Canadians, we understand the balance we have to strike between the regulated market and making sure that, you know, government and policy has a way to play itself out. You know, we want to keep the stuff away from kids, out of the hands of bad guys, build a business, tax it, et cetera, all those things. Um, there, there's some growing pains we have to undergo. But I wanted to point out some of the ones that kind of are quite stark. And I think for each of you in your communities, 
it's something that you want to be cognizant of if you're thinking about entering the cannabis ventures or if you're advising people or people are coming and asking questions. So I promise not to steal the thunder of my colleagues coming up, but I wanted to send this, uh, show this slide. Now they may have even more up-to-date uh, uh, statistics on that, but right now uh, approved in principle, we have six. Eight licenses have been issued, so hallelujah, we're there, it's good. Um, you know, we have uh, three in Vancouver, uh, and I know, I think all three have opened up now. Uh, in talking to the LDB, they were getting ready to ship product to those three licensees. Um, but that tells you the amount of activity we have. Um, the squares and bubbles to the right of the slide tells you how many people have applied. Okay. Now, what's interesting on the indigenous slide is that um, Chief Robert Louis from Osoyoos Indian Band, and Osoyoos, you know, is very mature and has very strong economic development uh, experience, uh, is leading a group called Indigenous Bloom. And Indigenous Bloom is setting up a regime and ability for Indigenous communities to create cannabis businesses. However, that is outside of the licensing Health Canada and provincial jurisdictions. And part of it, I think, is because our First Nations have the right of self-determination and self-government. So they're saying, hey, we will set, establish our own program. Um, it's going to be very interesting. We want to watch this space because we're going to have to see how the Indigenous model mirrors, reflects, ensures that some of the policy things around safety, around product testing, quality is managed and maintained. Um, I suspect, though, that this may come up to some friction points with Canadian regs, and it'll be very interesting to see how this moves forward. Now, I want to make sure that after seeing that, that the audience doesn't think that's what all our First Nations um, you know, neighbors and, and friends are doing. That's not the case. There are a number of them who said, you know what, fine, we'll go through the Health Canada licensing regime. Uh, we see this as an opportunity for our communities that extend beyond our communities, and we want to be able to sell into Canada. We also want to be able to participate as the uh, industry continues to iterate and build out. So, um, you know, like many things, uh, again, back to our quintessentially Canadian slide, um, these things are developing, and they will take some time to work their way into some sort of equilibrium. Okay, so let's keep moving. Some of the things that really kind of, you know, unfortunately become obstacles uh, is this slide. Um, on the left, um, the original farm, and I always give these guys a shout out because if you if you haven't seen it, well, you can't go into their stores now because they're closed. But this is a beautiful store. This is literally their Douglas Street store space in Victoria, and it's beautiful. And you walk in there, people are knowledgeable, lots of education, absolutely no pressure whatsoever. They have the ability for intake uh, and all sorts of different products, etc. This was before October 17th. What they did was in advance of um, le uh, legalization, they shut down. They said, you know what, we're going to apply, we're going to do it the right way, uh, we're going to be legit operators. They were really good operators to begin with. They actually held for example, one of their other locations, education sessions for adults. You could come in any evening and sit down and they'd walk you through the different strains, the cannabinoids, their uses, what research was available, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're still waiting for their application and you know, I'm not gonna put our colleagues on the spot to say, where are they? Um, but suffice it to say, they're the folks that stopped, still pay rent, try not to lay off their people, sold or destroyed their old inventory, which was under the gray market or illicit market. And then they run into things like the bullet points on the right, which kind of makes you go, okay, guys, you know, like we, we can do better here. And I can't think across the three levels of government, th these are some of the things where, you know, the red tape that trips people up, folks who are holding on, paying rent, you know, still paying their employees, but not getting any revenue. You know, I, I think this is, this is some of the, the sort of the, you know, a little bit of the head-slapping moments where you kind of go, can we be smarter about this? Okay. So, let's keep moving. This is George Robinson. 
Uh, George is very active in the cannabis space. And, uh, you know, he's predicting that we could have uh, five years um, shortage. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure it'll drag out that long, but here's what's going to happen when edibles come into play. Right now, we have a shortage of extracts, concentrates, isolates, everything that you can get out of the cannabis or the hemp plants. The active ingredients being THC and CBD. So CBD is the one that's calming, more sort of pain-related. Um, and THC being the one that's more uplifting and give people the psychoactive high. Two drivers of this is low amounts of those which are key inputs into edibles manufacturing, whether it's chocolates, cookies, gummies, you know, cells and tinctures for your hands or, or whatever it is. The other thing is the big LPs and even the medium-sized ones are driving a strategy to have an export capability because in a lot of those countries we see, Germany, Australia, etc., right now the, the medical regime under GMP or good manufacturing practices, many of our LPs are able to achieve that and have export capabilities, and they get guaranteed government supply contracts. So, you know, there's the toss-up. Do I sell into our medicinal regime here in Canada? Sure. Do I sell into our retail regime? Will I lose some margin? Do I, yeah, you know what, I, I should. We are Canadian. We want to supply the adult recreational market. But, you know, those government supply contracts in Europe are very lucrative, right? So there's going to be a constant pull on the amount of available inventory. And then, like I said, when edibles kick in, those inputs are going to be needed to be able to produce edibles. So another big pull on that inventory, on that capability to produce. Production methods, I leave this up here. Um, you can read this at your own leisure, but the reality right now is most people are working on the left. Costs are higher, right, but you get better yields. What's going to kick in at some point, even in Canada, is outdoor growth. So, yes, in fields. There are people applying for those right now. And there's also a lot of outdoor growth on an international scale. At the last Lyft conference, uh, when I was there walking the floor, and I've been to all the conferences over the last couple, couple of years here in the U.S., etc., I was surprised at how many international visitors we had. Um, not just, you know, oodles of Americans. I mean, that's awesome. But, you know, Colombians, Koreans, South African, you name it, they were there uh, trying to understand. People from India. Um, you know, understanding investment opportunities, technologies, how to build joint ventures, and, you know, export agreements, like it is moving very fast. Why do I share this with you? Because there are jurisdictions that the cost of production is ridiculously low. We're not even talking a dollar or so. We're talking, you know, 10, 15 cents a gram. And so that cost differential creates an arbitrage opportunity especially if at the end of the day your input is just extracted oil. You don't really care about the quality of the bud. You just want to get the active ingredients out. So we are on the cusp of seeing something shift uh, with edibles coming into play. And in a moment I'll give you, you know, Peter's editorial comment on that before we end this session. I want to keep going because I know we're pressed for time. This slide gives you a sense of what the cost of, you know, a gram of weed is um, across Canada. Um, this is government data, okay? Um, we don't know for certain. There may be some black market data baked into some of this. Um, but, you know, the prices are really interesting. Saskatchewan is high, Manitoba is high. What we do know that is that in the retail regime, for the retailers to make a decent margin, they tend to mark up their product and if there's an equivalent government retailer. So in BC, if you walked into the government store in Kamloops, you would pay one price. If you walked into the private retailer in Kimberley, uh, chances are if the same product was on the shelf, it would be a little bit higher. And understandably so, private sector is looking for obviously a decent return on their investment. Okay, This will start continue to shake out 
uh, as supply becomes less of an issue and as more and more retailers get on board. Uh, just stuck here. Give me a second, folks. So let's get into the industry opportunities and segments. Um, we show this because it's not all about cultivation and growing. Um, extraction is becoming very big and will become even bigger. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of spending a whole day, whole afternoon, at Quadrum Canatech, a publicly traded uh, extraction machinery company. And they actually have multiple segments. They want to extract, they want to consult, they want to help producers and other participants build their extraction facilities. They want to develop their own product lines, et cetera, et cetera. So they are trying to bridge what I call Industry 1.0 or Cannabis 1.0, which was all about growing and getting the legalization, to Cannabis 2.0, which is all about everything else on the screen and then stuff that we haven't even thought about. Okay? So, Let's get into it. There is growing, but then there's the end product. Right now the end product is oil and dried flour, um, but soon you will see so many more products. And in the slides that follow, you'll get a sense of that. But don't forget about all the, the facilities, the services that are required around this. Let me pick one off this slide. Banking and finance. Up to about six months ago, pretty much no financial institution would touch cannabis producers. Sure, Bank of Montreal led a big round for Canopy, but that's, you know, arguably that's easy, right? Because established Health Canada regulated, big dollars, investment banking, yada, yada, yada. But the reality with many of the LPs is they raise funds, and they go through dilution rounds of their shareholders is sometimes they just want a little bit of credit. Um, and I'm not talking about the pound on the back. I'm talking about, you know, mortgage, debt, line of credit. And the bankers were not stepping up, with the exception of one out of Ottawa, which is Alterna Credit Union and Alterna Bank. And Alterna, interesting enough, is the credit union for the federal civil servants. Interesting. Um, but the CEO saw this as an opportunity, and he saw that with like Health Canada licensing, the know your client, know your customer uh, due diligence, uh, he had something that he could rely upon. And so he was able to go out and bank a lot of the early entrepreneurs. The good news is many of the banks are coming on board. The schedule, the big Schedule 1 banks, you know, the, the, the big, you know, the TDs, CIBCs, they're still a little hesitant. I still hear stories about people either not getting banking, and I'm talking about basic deposits, like you know, like a checking account, to lending, um, or sometimes you, they find out they're in cannabis or a related business, and they say, "Sorry, we don't want your business." That's still happening, but it's becoming less and less frequent, thankfully, and more credit unions are stepping up. So, like for example, the first West family of credit unions, which is envisioned in the Okanagan. Um, now, so a vision in the Lower Mainland, Valley First in the Okanagan and Island Savings, we actually sat in an executive team meeting and talked to them about the industry so they could develop their strategy around it. Okay, so don't just think about cultivation. In fact, cultivation becomes one of several things in what I call the value chain of the cannabis industry, and it's all the ancillary services. I mean, hey, um, you know, your favorite little accounting firm. We've been working with this industry right from the beginning. You know, there's a reason why. Not only is an industry interesting, but there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of revenue to be had. I break it down even further. This is a bit of an eye chart. We are a consulting firm, so we always have to put something like this out to our clients and our audiences. But just have a look at that and see, you know, in the key value chain pillars as we go from left to right, some of the things that are the services or the products that can be sold into this. So if you think about the cannabis industry in Canada about being five or six billion just on cultivation, the multiplier on that I think is at least four, five, six, maybe even more times that just because of the spin-offs. And we're seeing it. Many of your communities, you're seeing that already. You know, construction folks, general contractors, engineers, architects working on these facilities. These are new purpose-built facilities, so they have to learn. 
right? Um, transportation supply chain to get to the retail outlets. And of course, the burgeoning push to try to get branding and design, even though right now the uh, regulations don't allow that. But a lot of people are iterating, trying to figure out how do I get my message out to the consumers. Hey, Peter. Um, yep. Hey, I'm going to break in. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, and then I want to let sure. Terry and uh, Joshua have a go at it, and then we'll have more yep. time afterwards, hopefully. A um, couple of questions. One of them, I'm going to put two questions together here. How long does the process take to get a Health Canada license? And is it possible to complete the application independently and spend less than 85 k on consultants? Um, let me do the last one. Okay. Yes, you don't have to spend 85 k You can go at it alone. There are other consultants out there that don't charge 85 k 85 k is coming from one of the big uh, national consulting firms that does this. Um, the reality of consultants is the more you do, the less they do, the less they charge. But there's also a re reality of a critical mass of um, knowledge and templates, et cetera, that they bring that can accelerate that, right? Now, let's talk about the wait time for Health Canada. There's an article a week ago that says the wait just keeps getting longer, and that's that's reality. Here's what's happening. There's still licensed producers, so the big ones, submitting applications. Some of those don't have their license to sell yet, so you have to get the license to produce, license to sell. So they're going through um, sort of iterations with Health Canada. When the feds announced that edibles are going to be legal in October, Health Canada knew that it would have to make a shift because now the processing license, so the ability to extract, handle materials to put into, you know, cookies or whatever you're making, you know, it could be gummies, um, that requires licensing oversight and obviously people to review those applications. And then you got micro cultivation kicking in. So Health Canada can't hire enough people. They're being stretched in different ways. And so that reality is creating a slowdown in license review and approval. So to, that, to tell you how long, I have no clue these days. Um, oh. Just every day is a different day. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned cannabis oil now a couple of times. Uh, is it slated to become legal with edibles? I'm not a those product are, expert, so. Yeah, yeah, those, those yeah. And, and so the oils themselves, um, you can get oil now, except there's not a lot of it on the shelves. That's the problem. Um, but then the, what the next iteration with edibles is you're going to get tinctures, delivery devices that you can spray, you know, in your mouth or drop under your tongue. Um, there could be more capsules. They could be combined with other things, too. And obviously, then all the food manufacturing stuff will kick in as well. So the key issues with oils and extracts right now, as I said earlier, is they can't convert enough because they can't grow enough biomass. They can't convert enough, and therefore there's not enough out there for sale to the public and to go into other product, um, other products that may be around the corner. Okay. Um, question. There was a question about what is a ready jurisdiction. What is a what? Sorry. A ready jurisdiction. I'm going to let uh, the folks that follow answer that one. That's a okay. license. Okay. Yeah. Alrighty, uh, and there was another question about one of your slides, but what I'm actually going to do uh, for the person who asked that question is I'm going to send Peter your question and he can respond to it uh, because I want to move on to Terry and Joshua. So thanks everyone. Keep those questions coming. I will uh, change the presenter uh, back to me briefly and uh, we'll get uh, Terry and... Josh, you're going to get fired up here, so get their, their PowerPoint slides up and running. And I'm going to unmute them just, you know, because that'll make it a lot easier. <laughs> there you go. Uh, now you're unmuted. Uh, for those of you who are uh, who can see, uh, my name is Terry, uh, Terry Ralph. I'm the Director of Communications and Stakeholder Relations with the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch. And for some of those of you around who are in the invite list, have been around for a while, have dealt with us in the past, uh, we used to be called the Liquor Control and Licensing Branch. So in fact, we're the same same outfit. 
and I'm the manager of licensing here in charge of both cannabis licensing and liquor licensing. Yeah. So without further ado, uh, let's launch into our presentation. Now we've been asked to talk specifically about the uh, application process in the province. So it's pretty straightforward and it shouldn't take a lot of time. So a few things we'll be covering here uh, on the screen, end-to-end -end application and licensing process, the local government's role, and the Indigenous role, uh, Indigenous nation role in licensing. A uh, couple, or three major tenants to get uh, a license complete, um, as you see on the screen. The complete applications, LG and IN have to be ready, and uh, the fit and proper, which consists of financial integrity assessment, and a security screening all have to be complete until to get to a successful license. Now, somebody mentioned earlier about the fact that you know what what's a ready local government. Well, a ready local government is one in our view uh, that uh, well, technically, it's when they say they're ready to to receive notifications for us about an application. Um, but you know, to be fully ready, of course, they they'll have their bylaws in place and and, and their processes in place to actually review these applications we send them. Not all local governments are there yet. And here is the timeline of what our process is. So first an applicant will apply through our online portal. Uh, they will submit to their payment, their $7,500 fee, and they uh, submit all required documents. After that, um, one of our staff will go through the documents, make sure that they are complete. Doesn't necessarily mean they're uh, correct at that moment, but right. that all the documents are there. Once all the documents are there, it um, we check with the local government to see whether or not they're accepting the application. If they're not, the application is terminated at that time with a refund. If they are accepting, we will send referral to the LG or the IN and then start the uh, financial integrity, the security screening, and of course the LG IN process is started concurrently with that for most jurisdictions. It should be noted that some jurisdictions wait until the improper piece is done. This, of course, the little asterisk at the bottom can make the process a little bit longer, um, all told. Uh, at, the, at the top, you see license application review. That little bar should actually go all the way to the end. Yeah, that's reviewed the whole time. It's reviewed the whole <laughs> time concurrently with the fit and proper financial integrity and security screening. Once we get past the fit and proper, so that we're all good, where there's no organized crime, there's no issues uh, with their security screening or their financial integrity, we will send a little note to LGRIN saying, we're done now, so that's for the the jurisdictions that are waiting for that, um, then they start their process to see whether or not uh, the zoning or the public input is in place. Uh, I should note that once we send it off to local government and fit and proper, uh, no refund. So once we determine the application is complete and the LG is accepting, we're now starting our process and we won't issue any refunds after that place. Yeah, yeah, that's because um, we're a cost recovery branch, right? Yeah. So uh, as soon as staff here start doing work on things, um, no refund. Okay, and then once uh, all those pieces have been complete, the financial integrity, the security screening, the LGIN recommendation, which is giving us the thumbs up, they, they're recommending a positive recommendation. We move to AIP, which is approval in principle, means that all regulatory requirements have been met, and uh, sometimes now the establishments need to be built um, or they're not quite ready to open their door or for further final, final inspection. After, uh, so they'll schedule a final inspection with an inspector who will go down there to ensure that all the documents they provided us match up with what's actually in the establishment. The floor plans are, what they say they are, the security cameras are there. Everything that they said was in place is in place. Um, if that's good, um, we then move right to license issuance. Sure. Yeah. So a notice of application, um, as Josh said, we review the application to make sure it's complete. So a, a local government is not going to be notified that there's an application until the two things are met, all the documents we've asked for are uploaded, and they paid the $7,500 fee. And as Josh said, all the documents might be uploaded, doesn't mean they're correct, because our staff will work back and forth with them to make sure that they provide all the correct information. Um, so then we notify the local government, and the local government does their business. Now, there's some interesting things here. Uh, first of all, the local government can choose whether or not to even hear the recommendation or, or to, to even entertain it. Uh, at that point, we tend to wait. We will not 
work on something until we hear back saying that we, the local government or indigenous nation, is going to actually entertain looking at this application. If they say we're not going to, then there's still an opportunity for the, for the applicant to have a refund of their $7,500. Um, so that's the first step. Uh, if the local government chooses to provide, not to provide a recommendation, then the application is terminated and that's that. Um, if the local government decides to provide a recommendation, there, there are requirements they, they must meet. They have, to, uh, uh, they have to consider the location, they have to assess the community impact, uh, gather the views of residents, that's actually quite key. They have to demonstrate to us they've done that. Um, uh, they have to tell us how the, you know, the residents' views were gathered. So in other words, they can't kind of cheat and it's just like, well, we put up a couple of notices and nobody said anything. Um, uh, and then they have to provide a rec uh, the recommendation to us, yes or no, we, we support this application and the rationale. And they have to do this in writing. Now, different than in the liquor world, we don't care. In fact, uh, the, the, the law doesn't care how they do this in writing. It, uh, some local governments will do this through a process, what do you call that, a um, uh, resolution, resolution uh, et cetera. But really, um, we felt, government felt that that sort of hampers the discretion of a local government or indigenous nation. So the reality is they have to do this back to us in writing in any way or manner that they choose to do provided these requirements are met. And the key part of this is that we don't have the authority to issue a license without the positive right. LG or IN recommendation. That's right. So the we're not going to issue a license if the local government says no. However, the caveat to that is if the local government or indigenous nation says, yeah, we support this application, there might be some reason we've discovered in our process why we shouldn't issue the license. So at the end of the day, the general manager of this branch has the discretion to issue or not uh, legally. So the local government, but, but in practice, we're not going to issue a license if the local government doesn't agree to it. Um, if the local government, but yet we're not bound to, to, issue, to issue a license, even if the local government does agree to it. There might be some reason why we wouldn't. Um, the local governments, of course, their regulatory powers are very similar to people who are familiar with a lot of the liquor issues. They can impose restrictions on store locations uh, in their zoning bylaws. They can charge applicants for uh, fees for um, their work in assessing the application. So they, and most local governments do some sort of cost recovery thing as well. Uh, municipalities, uh, note municipalities but not regional districts, uh, may limit the hours of operation or impose other conditions, like they might have certain bylaws with signage. Um, and these powers, all of what I were talking about, also apply to future relocations of existing stores. So we, down the road at some point, there's going to be a cannabis store that is going to relocate to within a community or to another community, and they still have to go through all of this process. The Indigenous Nations role in licensing is very similar. Uh, generally, everything we just told you applies as well, except for some key differences. Um, the process and regulatory powers are similar, but um, because and I think Peter touched on it earlier, um, indigenous, there are unique rights of indigenous nations uh, based on federal and provincial statutes that are, are beyond our cannabis statute here. You know? So the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act uh, aligns with that by giving the province the ability to enter into agreements with indigenous nations that, that can vary the requirements under our act. So in other words, if, a, if a, an indigenous nation wants to regulate uh, cannabis stores somewhat differently or, or, or based on the needs of their own nation, we'll, the, 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 the province must enter into an agreement with them on that and come to some sort of resolution. Uh, an indigenous nation itself can also apply for a cannabis retail license in its own name without being an incorporated business. That's different because, uh, you know, generally if you go to our website, we list the corporations like a society or, a, you know, private corporation, public corporation, all the normal stuff. But an indigenous nation can apply as the nation to be the licensee of a non-medical cannabis retail store completely outside of that. And if anyone cho chooses to do that, then they, 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 we actually, because there's no one size fits all in that case, uh, we will, as a branch, work with them directly. In fact, mostly it would be Josh on working with them. Yeah, on a case-by-case basis. Yeah. So, um, 
So as the slide here says, uh, uh, if an Indigenous nation applies for a license in its own name, we'll work closely with them and their partners. And again, there's no one size fits all. The, for both uh, local government or Indigenous nation uh, recommendations, here's a recap. Uh, just as a reminder, and this is really important, uh, we retain, our general manager of this branch retains the discretion whether or not to issue a license, but must consider the recommendation. So we'll, uh, but, but the, we cannot, we will not issue a license without a local government or Indigenous nation providing a positive recommendation. Uh, also, um, we can issue a license with conditions. So we decide, yep, from our perspective, license is good to go. Uh, they're, they're fit and proper. They should be people who run a, such a store. Um, and they maybe have asked us for certain operating hours, but maybe the local government has decided, nope, we don't like those operating hours. Uh, so we can issue the license with conditions based on the lead, some of the needs of the local government, as an example, with a restriction of hours. Um, if the local government or Indigenous nation recommend, recommendation back to us does not fully meet the regulatory requirements, um, we, the branch, will reach out to that local government or Indigenous nation and help them you know, provide us the information we need. I'm sorry I'm going fast, but I'm just cognizant of the time. Uh, um, answering common misconceptions. Um, applications aren't timestamped. People somehow think they are. Somebody applies to us, they start their application, there's a timestamp. It's not. The timestamp is only um, they've complete, uploaded everything that we require, correct or not, and they paid the fee. That is, and we, that's what we consider submitted. That, that's submitted. When we notify the local government, that's about as close to a timestamp as we have. But we don't technically have a timestamp. Uh, there's no, and another misconception is local governments or indigenous nations do not have a, a deadline to provide recommendations back to us. If they want to change, uh, sit, sit on a, uh, on a recommend, uh, you know, we, we sent them an application uh, in progress uh, and they decide, well, you know, wait a second, we need to actually change some bylaws around this. And it takes them a year. It doesn't matter. We, there are, there's no statutory deadline for a local government or indigenous nation to get the recommendation back to us. Uh, that frees them up uh, to, to do the process that, that suits their needs the best. Um, and again, the method for how they provide a recommendation is entirely up to them, which is kind of new uh, if they're used to dealing with liquor. Number of stores. The province is not setting any sort of uh, cap on the number of stores. There's no moratorium. Like uh, There's a moratorium on private liquor stores. You can't apply for a new private liquor store license. Um, but there is no such cap uh, for cannabis stores. There's also no provincial distance criteria. A lot of people, we get a lot of questions about that because there is with private liquor stores and government liquor stores now. Um, however, the local government and indigenous nation can set their own limit based on their own community needs. They can say, we're only having three stores in total in our community ever. Uh, or that we're going to have them, but they're going to be half, one, two kilometers apart. They can do that if they want. We should mention on that too, but the, there, although there's not a cap, there is, um, no one person or entity can hold more than eight stores. That's this slide. Oh, perfect. <laughs> this is actually, uh, don't blame Josh for that. I added this slide at the last <laughs> minute. He hasn't seen it. Because um, he reminded me yesterday, well, maybe we should talk about that. Uh, the number of stores continued. Uh, a licensee can hold, as he said, or have an interest in a maximum of eight cannabis retail store licenses. And that, that limit is going to be reviewed in 2021. Now, the curious thing about this uh, uh, limit is what we consider interest in. We're not going to talk about it here. It'll take too much time. Um, but there's a formula on what we mean by an interest. So if a corporation is trying to determine what, you know, so maybe there's a store where you have one shareholder, key shareholder, or one partner out of four partners that maybe has 20% interest in another store. Do we count that? Well, there's a formula, and, there, and, and licensing staff here will work through the applicant to help determine what that is. Too detailed to get into here. It is. Uh, it should be noted that this this is um, what we consider hard cap. So it's in the regulation as the, yeah. the general manager must yeah. not issue right. uh, to a person that holds more than eight stores. Yep. And for the purposes of this license cap, uh, a, a franchisor generally cannot have more than eight franchises. Um, and another thing, I just threw this in because uh, people ask this a lot. At this time, federal federally licensed producers of cannabis are not eligible to, to uh, be a cannabis retail store or licensee in BC. 
That's it. We motored through. Uh, here's some useful links uh, for those of you who get this electronically. Um, the local government role and the Indigenous nation role in licensing is spelled out there in detail in this, those links. More information is found on our website. Um, now, I tinkered with giving you all our direct phone numbers, but here's the reality. There's so many varied questions, so many, uh, you know, that we just hit on the tip of the iceberg, that it's easier to put a, this email address here, which my staff triage. So I would encourage you to use this email address if you have a specific question, because we can then easily triage to the various experts around the branch. And that's, uh, we can better serve anybody that way in getting a, the, the right answer in a timely fashion. So I don't know if there's time for questions. I know that we're past we Josh's time. He's got to <laughs> go. We do have time but, for questions. Um, I'm here. Uh, uh, Josh, as the manager of licensing, uh, knows a lot more about the licensing process and what they're experiencing so far than I do. But uh, if there's a question that I can't answer, I will commit to, yeah, we'll, get to we'll get you an answer. Okay. okay. Thanks, Josh. Great. And you guys can all yeah. Fabulous. So we have a couple of questions for you guys. Um, okay. What requirements does a retail licensee have with respect to property ownership or rental agreement before, reply, before applying oh. for their retail license? And yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and is it becoming onerous for small business owners? Well, okay, so there, there's a, that's a complicated question because <laughs> no. for various reasons. The easy part of the question is, uh, in order to, uh, uh, when you apply for one of these licenses, through the application process, you have to show that you have valid interest. That's a legal concept. It's in our act uh, and regs, you know, um, same thing with liquor. Valid interest is that you either have a legitimate lease, not like I'm renting on a month-by-month -month basis, <laughs> you know, like I have a lease, uh, uh, you know, that, say a year long or, you know, um, or I own the property. They have to demonstrate that, you know, it's not a fly-by-night operation in, in, in that sense, uh, like a pop-up store or something. So they have to have an actual lease or prove to us that they own the property. And that's called valid interest, and then they cannot apply for the license without that. They won't get a license without that. Um, if at any point while they have a license, they lose valid interest, like landlord kicks them out, says, you know, we're going to redevelop the property you're on, so we've just tore up your lease. They lose valid interest. Technically, they lose the license, but we have a mechanism for cases where it's beyond their fault, uh, where they lose their valid interest, where they can go into dormancy and find another place to be. So we're not, we're not so mean as we're just going to take away their license. Um, in terms of whether or not this is hampering businesses, I think as the regulator, it's kind of outside uh, our role to answer such a question. I know that, you know, the licensing process can take quite a while, especially, with, you know, sometimes, uh, um, you know, checking into backgrounds is taking longer than expected, or the local government piece is taking longer than expected. And we, we certainly cognizant that that means that somebody out there is maintaining a lease probably on a property waiting to open and that's costing them money. Um, but the reality is that, that the, the legal requirement is the legal requirement. And uh, so, you know, however I feel about that per personally, I can't say. As the regulator, uh, valid interest is a piece that, that must be met and that's that. Well, and also I would imagine that coming from a local government perspective, it's pretty hard to do a zoning process if you don't know for sure which piece of property you're zoning. So in order to yeah, consult with local true. government, you have to give them an address and they have to be relatively certain that that is in fact the address that is being right. discussed. So coming from my local government background, that makes sense. Believe it or not, we've, we've run into situations where people, you know, the local government's like, do we really need to know where they're going to be? We just, we just know they're going to be in a particular area. I'm like, oh, well, we still <laughs> legally need the valid interest before we can carry on with licensing. Ah, okay. So nothing okay. isn't, it's, really nothing to do with the local government. They, a local government can argue with us, don't worry about valid interest, we'll make sure they have a place later. Or we, the local government, are going to provide a place. It doesn't matter. Ooh. They need valid interest because it's in our legislation or regulation. Okay, cool. It's, um, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a requirement. It's sure. Okay, under what statutory authority do local governments limit the number of stores? Uh, that would probably, well, it's not under ours. Um, okay. We're not technically, I will, I will, the caveat to this is that technically uh, uh, 
in a program area, we're not to talk about other people's program areas because it's not <laughs> our jurisdiction. Okay. But, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, local government act and community charter stuff, right? Yes, that would be my understanding of it. It would be under the it's community. Not us. It, I, I'm pretty sure it's under the community charter. Uh, once again, not my program area, but a little birdie told me. Put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the thing is, how, how it works is when we're creating, when we were creating legislation and regulation to allow this to happen, um, we had to look at things like other statutes that might limit us. So, for instance, the reason why Indigenous nations have certain rights is because there's a federal statute uh, that we can't go against. Uh, the reason why we don't allow edibles in BC is because the federal federal cannabis act doesn't yet allow it. The reason why local governments can can make those own rules themselves is because they have certain powers under the local government act. So uh, our legislation can't go against those things, or at least we've chosen for it not to. In some okay. cases they can't. In some cases we've chosen for it not to. Okay, I've got a couple more questions here that uh, I'm not sure if you can answer. Peter might be able to, so I'm going to unmute both of you and ask the questions, and we'll see how we go. We've got about seven minutes left on today's webinar. We've got about four or five minutes of, of announcements at the end, so let's see how we can pack these in. Uh, can you confirm, or what is the role, if any, of the province and local governments in regulating microcultivation or microprocessing of medical cannabis? Federal. Yeah, it's, it's totally federal. Remember that chart where I had sat there, you know, across the three and the left? That's all federal regime. So what Terry and his team's doing and the LDB and, and folks like uh, Michael Tan, they're dealing with the wholesale and retail uh, licensing and the actual distribution of consumer product to the end, end user. Okay. And one more question. Is there a limit on how much land can be used to grow cannabis? Uh, the answer is no, but in the application process, you have to specify that. When you get into the land use question, though, it drops from the federal licensing regime because that, that plan has to be there, but it really gets down to local government zoning. Uh, I know that um, there are applicants having to deal with the ALR conversations as well, and that becomes, again, local government, regional district, and, and ultimately some legislative uh, issues if it is ALR. So um, it gets very complicated. is isn't a quick and simple answer for that. Okay. Cool. Uh, those were the questions so far. There's a couple of uh, other questions that came in that I'm going to uh, share with our speakers one by one. And I just want to thank you guys both for putting all the time that you put into sharing your knowledge with us and, and being on the webinar. This is uh, definitely one of our most popular webinars to date, but we have some more exciting things coming up. So I'm just going to take a minute to uh, talk about some of those things. And as I do this, I want to introduce my new colleague, Ben Kennedy, uh, and I'm going to unmute him and I'm going to get him to stick his, uh, you muted yourself, I'm going to get him to stick his head over here in front of the webcam. So Ben is going to be producing the rest of the webinar series uh, this spring. I'm going on a temporary assignment. There's Ben. There's Ben. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, so when Sue's off on this temporary assignment, um, we've got three more webinars upcoming um, that I think will be pretty interesting. So I'm just, we've, they're, put up, they're up on the screen there so you can access them by those links and then they'll be thrown up on our site in uh, the coming days. But basically we've got on March 21st, accessing capital in small communities. That'll be looking at how to help businesses in your community get the equity they need to grow. And we've got a few presenters on that webinar, David Ballester and David Wallace from the Investment Capital Branch here at the Ministry of Jobs, Trade and Technology, and Ian Wong, the CIO of the BC Immigrant Investment Fund. So that's on March 21st at 10 a.m. Uh, then Building Resilience Through Community Economic Development is April 4th, and the speaker for that, Jeremy Stone, the Director of Community Economic Development Programs at Simon Fraser University. He'll be introducing the basic concepts of community economic development and how they can be incorporated into your economic development work. And just rounding out this uh, section is post-wildfire marketing messages for communities. So that's on April 18th, and Kaylee Penner from Destination BC will share recent research that looks at what messaging works to maintain positive perceptions of the areas hit by wildfires and how to encourage visitation through those messages. So uh, make sure you tune in if you see some relevance uh, for your community to those webinars, and I look forward to uh, speaking to you then. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben.
Okay, and as usual, we have a couple of things coming up. We don't want you to miss any of the webinars. If you didn't find out about these from emails, you can sign up for our webinars email list, which is at this URL. You can always go to economic or gov.bc.ca slash economic development, and that will uh, give you all the links you need. Finally, here we go, we'll advance the slide one more time. Uh, we have put together a feedback survey. The questions are different this time. Both of our speakers want your feedback on their presentation. So it'll pop up for you when you complete this webinar, and it'll also get emailed to you in the link in about an hour. So please complete that and send your feedback to us so we can share it with the presenters. Once again, this has been recorded, so it'll be posted in about a week to our website. Uh, you can go there and find it under the past webinars link and also register for our upcoming webinars. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us, the speakers today and all the speakers we've had. I'll be lurking in the background. You'll see me on some upcoming webinars. And uh, thanks. Um, thank you for joining us. It's been a slice. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we finished the webinar, but Peter has graciously agreed to come back and finish his presentation. Um, Peter was on slide 23 talking about spin-off industries from cultivation of cannabis and some of the growth areas in, say, construction of processing plants and marketing for retail companies. So we're going to throw it back to Peter um, and let him finish off. So thanks again, Ben, for having me back. Uh, apologies for running a little over the other day. Um, where I wanted to pick up now in the presentation is what I see not only in terms of the grow and the extraction and the retail, we covered that already, but also what are some of the spin-off industries? What are the other opportunities in things where I've been calling it sort of cannabis 2.0 or industry 2.0? And I think it has particular relevance to the folks on this webinar whether you're in a local government, in an economic development role, or considering being an entrepreneur yourself, or finding ways to support this huge um, explosive growth of a brand new industry that's emerged upon us. And in BC, we create a, a, a different conversation just because of our sort of familiarity and our craft and our understanding of cannabis and related products and services. So with that, um, let's pick up where I left off. It's slide 23. And, you know, what are some of these spinoffs? And, you know, you can see them on the page yourself. But I wanted to pick up a couple. Now, first of all, the photo of the guy with the dark glasses and, and a gentleman in the back looking like he's either packing or unpacking a tote. The reality right now is third-party logistics and delivery so that supply chain fulfillment for the cannabis industry is a huge opportunity. In fact, it is right now a very sore spot in the post-legalization phase because a lot of the cultivators did a really good job in building out the cultivation facilities, but unfortunately it's not their area of expertise of thinking after I harvest it, trim it, package it, and frankly some of them don't even know packaging very well, what does that look like? How do I get it? You know, the right types of packaging to meet Health Canada regs, how do I put the CRA excise tax label on it? Oh yes, and how do I pack it into skids and get it to the LDB uh, in this province and how do they distribute it to the end retail outlet, whether it's the government stores or the private stores. All of that for many producers is a well-defined gray area that has to be built out. And so uh, that's a really good uh, photo of the reality of supply chain logistics and of course the uh, tough looking guy with the sunglasses is also another ancillary industry which is around security, security around the supply chain, physical security, and with a lot of the grow operations and the extractions and the supply chain, whether it's your own supply chain or third-party warehousing, third-party logistics, it's also logical security around data, information, you know, patient lists, all those things, Can, uh, you know, a consumer sort of uh, profiles and any sort of intellectual property that may have been developed. So just in that alone, in getting the flour, dried flour to market, you can see where the spin-offs are. The other one that's really interesting is the little one that looks like an iPhone app there. There is so much technology being built. There's such a huge demand for technology because if you think about it, 
a requirement in this regulated industry, Health Canada regulated industry right now, is the ability to track what they call seed to sales. So the ability to know where your product is in the whole life cycle of the product, where it's being stored, where it's been shipped, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Just like in food, just like in pharmaceuticals, there is a need to be able to track through that supply chain in case of product issues, recalls, etc. So again, the technology, the processes, the standard operating procedures, all that create the need for that expertise and those services and some of those tools to be developed or to be customized for some of these specific companies. Um, with that, I'm going to move to the next slide. And this one is a very lively conversation around BC. It's about craft cultivation. Um, and they are coming. In fact, Health Canada is getting tons of uh, applications. And I'll, the next slide will, will unfortunately talk about, uh, again, the whole bottleneck issue. But right now, this has become a, a very viable alternative for a couple of factors. One, it's for a lot of our growers in BC who've been doing this and are real, real artists, real craftsmen, real horticulturalists, real geneticists. Um, in sort of breeding and growing cannabis. I mean, if you think about, track back to, you know, anybody who's studied biology, you know, the monk Gregor Mendel breeding peas, you know, in the start of sort of modern genetics, um, there are a lot of people practicing in this area, and BC, as you know, is a hotbed for that. And so the ability for a lot of those people to transition from the illicit market into the legal market in microcultivation to continue to practice and hone their craft, I think is a wonderful opportunity. And certainly for throughout BC, you know, as we know, the Kootenays, the Okanagan, Lower Mainland, up and down the island, it's a real business opportunity. It's a real, it's a reality, actually. There are lower couple of costs. There is still licensing. Licensing costs, again, aren't for the faint of heart. Um, some, just the consulting alone is probably, you know, anywhere between fifty and and $100,000. The challenge right now is the time of the license. And remember, there's a backlog of licenses going in. And so between that and the costs of es are escalating around physical facilities to be able to create these opportunities for our craft growers to build out their own businesses. The good news on that, though, is there are a lot of entrepreneurs, those who, for example, come from uh, real estate and construction, who have uh, real estate available, who want to participate in the cannabis industry, or are not quite sure they want to lay down the capital required to build their own license, large license production, license cultivation facility. And some of them are creating what I call cannabis parts um, uh, to, to allow multiple units and micro cultivators to basically operate in those units. And so it's a bit of a win-win in that for the landowner, for the real estate guy or gal, they get some revenue from rental. Um, they also get, hopefully, a share of the revenue from any product sales. But it creates an opportunity for these artisans to get together and perfect their craft, share ideas, but have a place to call their own. The additional play that's a win-win is the sales of the product, whether it's the end flower or leaf, or the, the reality to process that to the end product, and it could be an extracted product, is also a, a reality that's being built in terms of it's a shared processing facility. So whether it's a shared ownership, almost like a co-op model, or the land owner also owns that processing, and then there's an ability to create some critical mass to go to other LPs or, for example, other government wholesalers and distributors to say, you know what, we'd like to sign an offtake agreement for our product across all these craft cultivators. So, you know, it, it is very much, and again, in BC we understand this, a community-based sort of cooperative model, and, and I'm really excited about this uh, as a way for a lot of people to participate who are already sort of doing that and done it for years, but to do it in a, in, a, in a licensed fashion. And again, back from a policy perspective, that's a good thing, right? Because we want to, pe to have people emerge into the light of this new industry. So. Let's talk about the backlog a little bit. Um, this article was published, um, you know, two weeks ago, or maybe three weeks now, and it is an uphill battle. Um, there aren't enough resources to go through. The micro cultivation uh, push, real opportunity, but as everybody starts putting more and more applications into the system, it really does bog it down. So 
Um, rather than getting upset, it's a reality. Um, we, we hope and we know Health Canada is trying to bring up more resources, but this isn't somebody who can just read a checklist and say, is it complete or not? You have to have some knowledge and ability to understand the regulatory regime and understand the business. And because it's a new industry in a new business, you know, there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg happening here. So it's going to take some time to take root. Um, but I see this going through. Um, the reality of weights, probably if you're trying to get an application now in, you're probably well over a year, if not almost 18 months to two years. And therefore, there is the need for entrepreneurs and those who are supporting them to be patient, to know that there's going to be capital and carrying costs throughout this. And so, you know, in my previous slide when I talked about the cannabis park and potentially a shared uh, operating model that helps reduce the risk of, you know, somebody trying to go it alone and having to sit out for 18 to 24 months waiting for licensing to happen and therefore not being able to operate and therefore not be able to generate revenue. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I want to touch again a little bit on the regulatory regime and something that I think is really going to further drive Cannabis 2.0. And that is what's highlighted in light green, fall 2019. So uh, our Liberal government, the Feds, said in December, edibles are coming. Bill Blair just this week reiterated that. He thinks uh, October 17, 2019, so literally a year after uh, cannabis was legalized for adult recreational use last year, we will have edibles. Now, there's probably the reality of supply chain and the various provinces getting their sort of ducks in a row. So even if it becomes legal in October 17th of this year, there's probably a build-out period that still needs to follow. But nevertheless, there's a commitment from the feds to make it legal. Interesting enough, right after they make it legal, we're all going to the polls federally to, to vote. So, you know, there's a timing issue here, and I think there's, a, there's obviously some political willpower, but again, that may change. And, you know, politics is not something that we, none of us have a crystal ball on that. But what's really interesting is on edibles and concentrates, the growth of that is incredible. And what we learn from other jurisdictions, especially in the U.S., the states that have legalized, Colorado, Nevada, Washington, California, the switch from smoking the product to ingestion in other ways to tincture cells, when those hit the shelves, it was a huge shift. In some places, the shift was so much that they had excess biomass that they had to figure out how to convert into extracts so they could be inputs to create these other products. We don't expect anything different here. And in fact, if you think about it, as most adults, if you're, if you're a consumer of cannabis, you know, are you really interested in putting smoke in your lungs anymore? Probably not. And as, you know, as, as the market matures and goes older, and we have demographic data that's showing that you know, one of the fastest growing segments is the above 60 segment. And another segment is the, the middle-aged uh, women who often make wellness decisions for their families you can start thinking about how that will drive the marketplace and demand for products other than uh, combustion of, uh, of flour. So it's very exciting and people are building businesses right now. So what does it look like to launch an edibles business? New market full of opportunities as we talked about, but there's some challenges and just like the iterations and the starts and stops towards October 17th of last year, we're going to see the same thing this year. The position paper has been put out by the government, regs. It's open for common period, but there's some things in there that make you kind of, you know, scratch your head a little bit. For example, dosing right now is so low at 0.5 milligrams that you kind of go, does that even make sense, right, per unit, you know? And if, and I want to jump on this one a little bit, and, and it's a bit of a soapbox issue, but as I explained to you, I think most people understand it. So. And one of the reasons why you want dosing to be low is with edibles, the key mantra is go low and go slow. And that's smart. Frankly, it's smart for anything you're going to put in your body. But if that's our mantra and you give it so low that it almost has no effect, then, you know, you can see a consumer eating one, nothing happens. Second one, nothing happens. And they say, well, this ain't happening. And then what if they then grab a handful? Aren't we, isn't it counterintuitive to what we're trying to do with policy? 
The other thing is when you make the dosing so low per unit, those units likely are going to have to be packaged separately, child-proof containers, so there's multiple levels of packaging. So the cost per unit goes really, really high. So from a public policy perspective of promoting responsible adult use and, uh, and enabling a business, I think an economically viable business, that, that dosing decision almost runs countercurrent to it. The other reality is, as we are Canadians pr proud that our cannabis legalization regime is being looked upon across the world and being copied and being, being lauded, you know, on CNN, you know, and, 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 you know, talk shows and everything, we are doing a great job in slowly releasing the genie out of the bottle. But the reality is the genie was out of the bottle last October. Now, with edibles, as you would if you were going through a retail location, which retail is here, it's totally legal, consumer preference needs to kick in. And with sort of some of these legislative requirements, my concern is what we're trying to do is promote responsible use and some controls, but what we end up doing is stifling consumer preference and demand, which further drags on the marketplace and really, frankly, destroys a lot of efficient use of capital. And the other reality is other countries are already here in Canada competing. And my next slide will show you that. So these are all products you can get in the United States. Dixie Elixirs is a client of ours. They're listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange. They're based out of Colorado, but they have, they literally built, because in the states you have to do it state by state because it's federally illegal. They have built the same company in Colorado, in California, Nevada and Maryland, and they've come here, and frankly, we're like the 51st state, all right? So look at their product line on their left there, all right? And so imagine the Canadian equivalent is all plain sterile packaging, CRA label on it, with a little bit of cross and skull bones um, warning because it contains THC or CBD. How does that enable consumer preference and demand to, to take hold, okay? so. There's a reality here that we will have to iterate and figure out, and hopefully as the regs come out and people comment on that, it will allow the business to flourish and allow us to maintain that leadership position that we have in the world without destroying capital, without taking out choice, taking choice out, or really trying to legislate responsible use. Because at the end of the day, all of us as adults, we have to be accountable for what we choose in, in this marketplace. So, so forgive me for the editorial comment, but back to edibles, but it's, it's, I think you need to understand that if you're thinking about investing in, supporting, or going into uh, this side of the business. Exciting as it is, there's some realities that are still things that have to be figured out and potentially overcome. In Canada, we also have a very sophisticated food and regulatory regime, one of the world-class ones, right? Uh, Canada's Food uh, Inspection Agency is world-class. Um, our ability to deal with food issues is incredibly quick, um, you know, and it's a wonderful sort of parallel to what's coming through Health Canada. I expect in an oxy-distant future that the regimes will have to look at each other and merge. Right now they're separated. Right now uh, one of the pronouncements or one of the regs is you can't co-locate. So if you're a CFIA inspected everything food manufacturer, you can't just go, well, I'm going to go and do Health Canada licensing and I'm going to just swap out, um, you know, tooling on my machinery. You can't co-locate. And there's probably a reality that it's, it's allowing the industry to emerge slowly on control, but also it prevents, again, some of the efficient deployment of capital on one hand for the big food processors, but on the other hand, it supports the small entrepreneurs in trying to get their feet under them. So, you know, you can decide, but again, that's another... Uh, uh, interface and, and friction point that has to be figured out. Um, the other realities are, you know, caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, and, and THC, you can't mix them, okay? But there are people who are smart and trying to figure this out as well. And we're also trying to learn, uh, if, for example, Colorado, Colorado will be the first event they went too fast. So the Canadian approach is much slower. I think some, some of that is a little too slow but it's allowing this to emerge. But it will be slow and steady, and it won't be all figured out come this October, but it will be legal. Some notes on Canadian expansion. I'm gonna take a moment to talk about beverages. 
these are some landmark deals and landmark initiatives. So to say that the alcohol giants are involved is to kid yourself. What's not on this slide is um, Anheuser-Busch has a uh, joint venture research agreement, $50 million in with Tilray. And Tilray, as you know, has big facilities on the island. So Canopy Growth, Tilray, Hexo, all big licensed producers. All of us recognize the brands out there from beverage alcohol. Um, and I'll talk about province brands in a minute. They are a client of ours. They're based out of Toronto. But why did the alcohol giants move in and invest? And Constellation was the most was the first mover and most aggressive. And by the way, tobacco giants have done the same. Because of the fact that they are seeing a substitution effect. Not this New Year's, but the previous New Year's in Colorado, there was a news article that said, over New Year's, the sales of recreational cannabis uh, in, I think, one of the ski destinations, probably Vail, um, outpaced that of alcohol. You know, that should catch your attention. And it certainly caught the attention of these folks. And with these investments, it put not only capital into each of these licensed producers and what they're doing, but it also signaled to the marketplace that big uh, liquor uh, brands, alcohol beverage brands, uh, are in. And it also put a very strong exclamation point on the industry and the valuations in the industry. So with each of these investments, obviously, you saw jumps in share prices of the public traded one. Now Province Brands is really interesting. They're trying to brew beer using cannabis. So they know about the whole THC and alcohol thing and so they're trying to figure that out. There are other brands, there's a company again out of Toronto called Hill Street Beverages. They make the alcoholized beer and wine. It's available out there right now. They're trying to figure out how to infuse that because they don't have to deal with the alcohol uh, and, and cannabis, THC, CBD mix. So again, a lot of exciting developments. See more in this space. But then I come back to how does consumer preference get to play a hand or lend a voice to this if everything is in plain white packaging? These brands, the reason you recognize them right away is because they're in our, they're in our faces, right? We see them on TV. We see them in ads. We see them at sporting events. And so there's a reality of that fine balance that has to be struck as we emerge into the edible space. I wanted to kind of share with you our thoughts on what you need to do if you're thinking about going into this. Um, it's common sense, but you know, if, if everybody had a dose of common sense, um, well, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> so, and we wouldn't need regulators. Um, so the market research to understand is critically important. Uh, we see a lot of companies coming in saying, oh, um, you know, we've been making chocolates our whole life. Uh, we think we should go into cannabis edibles. Like, you know, we, we make great fudge, so let's do THC fudge. Well, no, it's not that easy. There's something called licensing. Again, you can't co-locate. you got to get dosing right. All the things that we would expect to see, you know, like imagine this was a can of, um, of soda, a pop. You'd want to see on the label, like, you know, number of calories, active ingredients, all that stuff. You expect to see that. So there's a reality to building this that still has to happen. The business model itself, are you going to get a license? What does the product mix look like? What does machinery to produce, brew, package, you know, all those things? What is your distribution model? Because at the end of the day right now, with the exception of Saskatchewan, everybody has to sell to the provincial government, right? If you are already a branded company, what does it do for your current brand? It's a bit of a mad gold rush opportunity mentality right now for this opportunity because everybody and his brother and sister thinks like, hey, if I'm, if I'm already growing cannabis, man, I should be making edibles. Really? You're good at growing. We've already talked about the supply chain challenges a lot of growers have had. Switching over the capital intensity to create basically a food and beverage line, hmm, is that easy or should you stick to growing? Um, obviously stay informed. The legislation is changing. The regs are out for comment. It will change between now and October. Um, obviating risk or mitigating risk, remember my cooperative model, but if you think about those previous slides where you had the big 
alcohol giants working with a large licensed producer. They're collaborating, but they're also sharing risk. And of course, shameless plug, but you know, get some advice. You can't figure it out all by yourself. Um, this is a brand new world, and it's an intermingling of existing industries as well as new industry regs and players. So, I'm getting to close. I want to talk a little bit about the tech boom. I talked about it earlier about that app. Um, there is so much. Some of the uh, grow buildings I've walked into, um, some of the best ones, like one of our clients, Tantalus Labs here in Maple Ridge, like they purpose built a greenhouse. They didn't just buy an old greenhouse and retrofit it. They graded it, purpose built it, they angled it because their value proposition, and you can understand it, especially from a BC perspective, is they want it sun grown, organic, they want to know exactly what is touching the plant. And so they've even angled it to, to maximize the traverse of the sun. Um, some of the materials reflect, so they bounce light throughout the greenhouse. Um, you know, and, and they have IoT devices measuring not only water, but all sorts of nutrients going right to each individual plant. So they've got Internet of Things in there, incredible technology. And that is just the beginning. There are so many people iterating on this, whether it's the growing side, whether it's the back office enterprise resource, the ERP side, whether it's, oh my God, the boring finance and accounting side, all of this is coming together and creating new technologies that we haven't seen. Even things like ventilation fans, etc. that's also uh, being built out and, and being innovated right now as we speak. Off-grid grow ops, the outdoor grows, um, the ability to harness natural sources of energy Unbelievable. And for those who say, well, Canada's too cold, we can't do outdoor grows, check your thinking. There are people applying for those licenses right now, right now. And if you think about it, what are they likely to grow? Do you think they're growing biomass to create the, the most high-end, customized, you know, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, Dom Perignon of Cannabis, no. They're growing mass quantities at low cost because they're going to sell into Industry 2.0 or Cannabis 2.0, which is the edible space, because that input is still required. And even, you know, my apologies, it's, 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 a, it's, it's not meant to be derogatory, but, you know, like basic kind of boring industries like compost and fertilizer, my goodness, at so many trade shows, we see so many of those players. We see people working on pesticides. We see people working on iterating on naturally controlling pests using insects to control other insects. And again, the goal is to build into this industry. Um, organic is huge. I don't think I need to spell that out to the BC crowd. Um, the ability to integrate in a responsible way, it's so hard of what we do and so many people in this industry. Um, and the ability to extract, I, I spent time at a publicly traded extraction manufacturer, extract company, uh, manuf excuse me, extract machine manufacturer called Quadrant Canatech in Langley, uh, run by uh, this incredible woman, uh, lawyer, cannabis activist, activist. She's the CEO. Her name's Rosie Mondin. And it was interesting just seeing the innovation and the technology they put into their machines. But not only their machines and selling machines to help people do CO2 or ethanol extraction, but also the ancillary services and the potential to build their own product line. And, and already companies and entrepreneurs and executives are looking at multiple ways to participate in the industry in so many different ways. So with that, I hope this has been helpful for everyone. I really appreciate your attention and opportunity to come back. And, and present the rest of my slides. Here are my contact details. Shoot me a note. Always happy to chat. And Ben, thank you again for the opportunity. Thanks a lot for that, Peter. That was really informative and uh, interesting presentation. And um, yeah, look forward to seeing what happens in the future. Thanks very much. Have a great day.